Hello team, are you ready for video 12, our final one in our chemical reactions journey, really chemical equations. We're going to do reactions, uh, you know, qualitatively predicting products and that kind of stuff in the next chapter. We're doing all the math stuff this time, right? All the stoichiometry, that's the focal point, the meat and potatoes of this whole journey we're on right now is is how do we relate amounts of reactants to products or one reactant to another reactant and we're in solutions now so one of the most common things you're going to be doing in a laboratory is making a solution so a lot of we run lots and lots of unknowns in general chemistry now in introductory chemistry typically we'll make those for you and uh, and then we'll know the true value and then you get it figured out but in general chemistry there's several of the unknowns that you're going to make yourself. Hey, right? So how do you know how to make it? Or you have to, maybe it's an unknown we provide for you and we know the value, um, but, you know, say it's an acid or something, and then you need to titrate it with a base, but you don't have a base to titrate it with. So you have to make your own solution and you want to what's called standardize it, know its concentration to, you know, usually four significant digits. Um, or prepare a back titrate solution. There's a whole different situations you're going to be using solutions, and you want to know uh, the concentration quite accurately. But how do you make those? Now, physically, we're going to do that in a different video for lab, preparing solutions. There's you know probably 10 or 11 steps I'm going to go through and show you how to do that on the video, and we're going to practice that in lab. Here, we're just going to do step one. How do you calculate the amount of solute needed to make a desired solution. So in laboratory, it might say, hey, you know, make 500 milliliters of uh, 0.1 molar solution of potassium phosphate. Okay, you gotta go make it. So you look around, see what's available in the lab. If we're in the stock room as a professor, maybe you work in a stock room, you look in the back room and you'll see, usually the solute will be a solid or a more concentrated solution called a stock solution. Those are our two options. We're going to find a solid. Usually those are ionic compounds, hydrated things like that. Like we use a hydrated acid, uh, potassium hydrogen phosphate, potassium hydrogen phthalate. Uh, we use uh, oxalic acid, a hydrate of oxalic acid. So, and some of those are, are in a solid form. That's okay. You know, whether, whether it's a solid or a, a solution doesn't matter, but the way we do the calculations is slightly different. All we need to do is figure out the amount of that solute you need for a given volume and a given concentration. Now we know molarity is moles of solute per liter solution, so this should be pretty easy to calculate, simple calculations. So first find out, is my solute a solid at room temperature when I make the solution? And if so, we're gonna calculate the mass required, the grams, and we'll weigh that on a balance, right? But if you don't see any solid solutes and you see a stock solution, so maybe we, we got to make a one molar hydrochloric acid solution, and all we see is a three molar hydrochloric acid solution bottle laying around, right? We're not going to have bottles in the stock room of every possible concentration. You got to be kidding me. So we'll have some large bottles of higher concentrations pre made or purchased from a manufacturer. And then we'll just take a certain amount of that and dilute it down. We'll talk about dilution by adding water. We'll take the higher concentration, just add water to dilute it uh, to the appropriate concentration we want. It's just like, you know, if you're, uh, you know, I have these little squeezy tubes I use to make, um, you know, water. I get water, I'll drink at the gym or something like that, but at home, you know, it, eh, it doesn't have a flavor. So I'll add these, these it's a little thing I, I take it off and squirt the stuff in there. It's like a a booster for my aching joints, you know, when you hit my age, you're like, oh, everything hurts and pops, and it gives a little raspberry or cherry flavor or something. And there's a recommend, recommended amount. So it says squirt this in to make one bottle of water. I'm like, well, I'm a frugal cheap, <laughs> right? So I won't make a bottle. I'll take that amount, squirt it in a gigantic jug at home, which is probably four or five of those bottles. So it just dilutes it down tremendously, saves me a lot of money, doesn't taste that great, but <laughs> you get what I mean. So we'll talk about how to do the calculations for dilution. I'm going to derive a really cool equation for you. Now that we know what we're looking for and how to recognize it, let's do one example for solid solutes, one example for stock solutions or higher concentrated solutions of that same species you're looking for. Boop, couple examples. You're good to go for step one. So now when you go to lab, 
you will learn how to properly prepare that solution without screwing it up and accidentally contaminating it or diluting it by adding too much water. That's one of the biggest mistakes I see, and that requires a whole separate video. Let's do some sample calculations. All right, this may actually seem easy compared to the stoichiometry stuff we did in the last video using normality, molarity, mass percents, and volume percents as a conversion factor in a stoichiometrical calculation. This is almost simple compared to that. These are usually one or two step problems, maybe three if I give you some weird units or something. Uh, and we're not gonna deal with gas solutes at this point, right? We could when we get to gas laws and whatnot, but we're sticking with solid and higher concentrated uh, solutes. All right, here we go. What mass of potassium oxalate, just for kicks and giggles, we pick that one, is required to make 250.0 milliliters of a 0.9841 molar solution of potassium oxalate. And that's got a cation anion, so it, it, pretty much in all of your general chemistry, uh, any ionic compound is going to be a solid at room temperature. So you go back in the stock room, go to the shelves in your general chemistry laboratory, and you'll find jars of it, right? Um, and remember, never stick your finger in there. Don't stick, you know, exit holes only. Don't contaminate it by shoving something in there. So follow the laboratory techniques properly to not contaminate my solutes, man. I see the weirdest things in lab, I'll tell you. And it may be phrased differently, but in this situation, this would be a valid, say, theoretical uh, quiz or exam question. So how do we figure this out? Well, remember, molarity is our conversion factor. That's the, the moles of the solute over the liters of solution. I could use, I could use if it was an acid or base, normality, we could do mass percent, all those fun things. So, but molarity is by far the most common concentration unit you're gonna find in an undergraduate laboratory. So let's take our volume. If we do our game plan, right, let's do our game plan. We're gonna start with the milliliters of our solution. And then we got to figure out what mass of solute, and it didn't specify, so let's just do grams because that's what we're going to weigh. Our balances weigh in grams, right? And depending if you need to top load it to two decimal places, milligram balance to three, or an analytical uh, balance to four decimal places will be specified in the laboratory itself. Right? But let's just follow the, it looks like we're going to end up with four significant figures in this one. So let's take the milliliters of solution, and we want to end with the grams of K2C2O4. That's our solute, right? So we gotta get from here to here. The main conversion, solution to solute, and that's what the molarity is. Now molarity is moles per liter, so we gotta convert to liters of solution using our thousand to one ratio, which is exact. And then we can apply the molarity to get to moles of K2C2O4. That'll be the molarity, so that's going to come down right here. Boop. Just like that. And then we just use the molar mass of potassium oxalate from our trusty periodic table. We're good to go! So one, two, three step problem. Let's punch this out. Let's start with our milliliters, 250.0, and we'll be using in lab volumetric flasks, so you'll see that with the lab video. So let's take our 250.0 milliliters of solution, convert that to liters. So 1,000 milliliters per liter, check! And those units cancel out. Now we can go liters of solution to moles of solute using the molarity. So for every liter of solution, there are 0 0.9841 moles of solute. Oop. Need it more symmetric. There's the new application as a, just like we did in stoichiometry, it's just a conversion factor between amount of solution and amount of solute. So liters of solution cancels out. Now we're in solute terms. And we're in moles, so now let's get to grams. So we need the molar mass. So for every mole of potassium oxalate, I ran out of room to write the uh, potassium oxalate formula, so I just put grams there. 
So let's get, we've got uh, two potassiums, two carbons, and four oxygens. So take potassium times two plus carbon times two plus oxygen times four. Limited by decimal places because it's technically potassium plus potassium plus carbon plus carbon plus oxygen plus oxygen plus oxygen plus oxygen. <gasps> it's an addition problem. So let's look at potassium. Looks, uh, hey, okay, 39.0983. Uh, going to times that by 2, and that'll be to four decimal places. Let's find our carbon, 12.011 times that by 2, good to three decimals. And our oxygen, 15.9994 times 4, good to four decimals. So it looks like this periodic table limits us to three decimal places. And again, would use the periodic table the professor is providing you at the time, so you can get the answers they're getting. So if I take those all together to three decimals... I get 166.216, there's our three decimals, 216, so 166.216, vertical dash line, giving us six significant figures, by the way, uh, and then go two more past that dash line, I get two zeros, so 166.21620 grams per mole, good to three decimal places. And once we go to three decimal places, it gives us six significant digits in the molar mass. We got four significant digits in the concentration. Remember, concentrations are not exact. Metric conversions are exact. And we've got four significant figures. That's why we do 250.0, right? And you'll find volumetric flasks are usually good to four significant digits in the laboratory. We're going to be good to four significant digits. Hey, hey. As long as you don't screw it up in lab, you'll get this concentration. So punch this out. What do you get? And let's see, I gotta, I gotta cancel out my units. Moles of solute goes, leaves us grams of potassium oxalate. And I, I didn't have room for the K2C204 over there. So I get 40.89 vertical dash line. There's my four sig feet. Give me two more non-significant digits. 40.89, 33 grams. That does not round up. Correct, so that'll stay at 40.89 grams of solute. Not too tough, right? And we can have any solid solute we want, whether it's ionic, covalent, you know, if it's a large covalent molecule, like some of the sh different sugars and stuff, those would be solids. You're good to go, not too bad. All right, let's look at what we do if we have a concentrated stock solution. We could do it using uh, unit line equations, but I'm going to derive a nice little shortcut. I don't do many shortcuts in my class, but I'm going to derive a shortcut equation called the dilution equation that you can use because it's so commonly done. Uh, I mean, almost every day if you work in a chemistry uh, environment or any kind of science environment where we're using utilizing solutions, you're going to be diluting more concentrated solutions to make less concentrated ones by adding water. So we'll derive a real cool equation for you. Be right back. What do we do if we have a more concentrated stock solution? So before we do a problem, let's derive this cool equation for you called the dilution equation, one of the most common ones you'll see in chemistry. Does it make sense if you need to make, a, say, a, like I say, a 0.1 molar solution of uh, you know, hydrochloric acid, and you only see, say, a 6 molar or 3 molar one, a higher concentrated one in the stock room or in your uh, general chemistry lab room on the shelf somewhere? I have to add water to it. I, I think you all growing up, you know, it's common sense to know that to, to dilute something, you're adding water to it. <clears throat> now, we're going to be adding, of course, don't use tap water. Use deionized water, the pure water. We're going to add water to the more stock, a concentrated stock solution. So we have to figure out what volume of that concentrated stock solution we need. And add enough water to it, right, to create the volume of the overall solution we need, which will be the, the combined volumes of the stock solution plus the water you add. Well, molarity is as moles of solute over volume of solution. Does it make sense if you add water to a solution? you're not increasing the number of particles of solute, correct? Because water is the solvent. So by adding water, you are not increasing the moles of solute in the numerator, but you are increasing the volume of the solution, the denominator. So if the numerator stays the same, but the denominator goes up, you're dividing by a bigger number, the molarity is going to drop, correct? So by diluting something, you're decreasing the molarity. I think that's common sense, and you can see it mathematically. You probably heard that, that uh, 
coined phrase, the solution to pollution is dilution, <laughs> right? Maybe not today anymore, but back in the old days, just ah, dump it in the ocean and dilute it out. Things have changed since I was a child. <laughs> Big time, man. The last 50 years, huge changes in environmental laws and things like that. It was a little crazy when I was a kid. <laughs> it's amazing we don't have all these mental problems. I remember buying leaded gasoline when I was a kid. We had the leaded gasoline, unleaded gasoline. Most of you today can't even contemplate the fact that we use leaded gasoline. <laughs> so fun. All right, let's do a little manipulation of stuff here. I'm going to rearrange this and solve, understanding moles of solute does not change when you add water. So let's flip this and solve for moles of solute. Are we good? Now let's go like this. Can you solve for moles of solute? Well, that would be the molarity, or any concentration really, times the volume. And let's just use capital V for the volume. So that would be the molarity times the volume of the solution. That's true for the concentrated solution and it's true for the diluted solution. Everybody agree? Both before dilution, let me do this in another color. Right, so that's true before you add water to it. If I add water to it, the moles of solute stays constant. So the molarity will drop, the volume will go up. They're inversely proportional. So this is also true after you add water, correct? So that's true both before and after dilution. So let's say before, let's call this M1 and V1, state one. If that equals moles of solute, then after dilution must also equal moles of solute. Therefore, they must equal each other, correct? So let's call after dilution state two, or you could do initial final. So sometimes you'll see MIVI equals MFVF, but most commonly I'll see M1V1 equals M2V2. That is your dilution equation. Now, if you're not using molarity and using some other concentration, we could use C as a general one. We could Sometimes you'll see this. That's the one I prefer because it's a little more generic. This one pegs you with molarity only. This one you could use any concentration, and it's a ratio. And what's, and what's neat about this, the volume units will cancel out. So it doesn't matter what they are. They don't have to be in liters, right? Molarity should be in liters, but as long as they're, if they're both in milliliters, the milliliters cancels out. So it's a nice little shortcut that you don't have to convert out of liters into milliliters. Sweet, sweet, sweet equations. You know, they can be provided on exams, but that's very easy to remember and easy to derive as well. So let's do a calculation where we take a more concentrated stock solution, try to figure out the volume of that more concentrated stock solution uh, that we need to add water to to create a solution with a lower concentration. Let me stick that up on the board. Great little equation, and that's where it comes from, the fact that the moles of solute does not change upon adding water, more solvent. That allows you to derive this cool little shortcut equation. Typical example for you that you'll do a lot in lab, lots and lots. And it may be phrased slightly different from this, but you get the idea. How many milliliters of a 6.0 normal, ha ha ha, doesn't matter what concentration units I give you. Um, we can do molarity, normality, volume percent, doesn't matter. We'll do normality just for kicks and giggles. A 6.0 normal nitric acid solution must be diluted to prepare 500.0 milliliters of a 0.215 normal nitric acid solution. All right, or you might see this in a laboratory. It says, hey, prepare a 0.215 normal nitric acid solution provided a 500 milliliter volumetric flask. Oh, okay, well, it's, it's the same type of problem. And then you look around the lab and you find only a bottle, maybe a, you know it's a 500 mil bottle of 6.0 normal HNO3, or maybe it says molarity on there, and then you got to convert the molarity to normality, or vice versa. You know, got to go apples with apples. And you'll see these quite a bit back in the old days with acids, right? Today it's mostly molarity, but back back when I was younger, there we saw a lot of normalities on the actual bottle labels, common for acids and bases. 
we can we, immediately we know, hey, this is not a solid. This is a concentrated stock solution. So how many, what volume of that do I need? And we're going to probably measure that out using a burette or a graduated cylinder uh, in milliliters. We know this is our dilution equation, right? So we know, and since that's normality, I can't really use the M1V1 equals M2V2. So let's use the C1V1. So we know C1V1 is C2V2. One side will be the diluted solution. One side will be the concentrated solution. It does not matter. Don't have a hissy fit trying to figure out, you know, going gray like me. Which side is the concentrated one going? It doesn't matter, <laughs> okay? As, as long as you will keep the concentrated solu uh, uh, volume with the concentrated um, concentration and the diluted volume with the diluted one. So for kicks and giggles, Let's say this is the diluted one. And let's say the concentrate. And if you flipped it, it's okay. You would just solve for V1 instead of V2. See, I'm trying to solve for V2. What's the volume of the concentrated solution? If you flip these, you just solve for V1. We just identified and labeled things differently. We'll get the same answer. It's okay. I see people just trip out on that. Here we go. I like you to isolate your variable. So we're solving for C2, I'm not C2, dirt. The volume of that six molar more concentrated nitric acid solution. Since I define that as concentrated, that'll be V2. So that'll be C1V1 over C2, right? So divide both sides by C2. I like you to isolate your variable. It's so, it's not right or wrong mathematically, but it's so much nicer for somebody reading your work to do the algebra for them. Readers don't like to think. They like you to do that for them. So it just, and it helps you see the units work out a little bit. Notice uh, here the concentration units are going to cancel out. So it doesn't, whatever the units of volume are in this problem will end up being the units, you know, the units provided. Since I gave you uh, milliliters here, we're going to stick milliliters there. We'll end up with milliliters in our, in our thing. If we were solving for a concentration, the two volume units just need to be the same so they cancel out. It's pretty straightforward. So what is the concentration of the diluted solution we're after? 0.215 normal. Everybody see that? So let's put 0.215 normal. And since this is not a unit line equation, we don't have to write that as equivalence per liter. We just leave it as capital N because it's going to cancel out the capital N from the 6.0 normal. Ah, but if we did it as a unit line equation, then you have to take capital M's and capital N's and write them as the numerator denominator. All right, V1 is the volume of the diluted solution we're after, which is 500.0 milliliters. Let's divide that by C2, which is the concentration of the stock solution we found in the lab or stock room. That's the 6.0 normal. Notice the normality cancels out. Bye-bye. Leaves us milliliters. And we've got three significant figures in the concentration that we're after. Four significant digits, probably from the volumetric flask. But we only see two significant digits on the stock solution bottle. Oh, can't somebody figure that out to more decimal places? <laughs> right? That'd be better if that was known to at least three, right? Preferably four would be nice. So that was kind of just sloppily made, most likely. So let's do this to two significant figures. So punch this out. And if you get an answer higher than 500, something's wrong. <laughs> right? So what do we get? I get 17.91. Nope, let's do that down here. 17.91 milliliters. Good to two significant figures. That's greater than five, so it's closer to 18 than it is to 17. So that's going to round up to 18. So that's the first step in our solution preparation. We need 18, well, we could probably measure out 17.91 using burettes or something like that. Um, 50 mil graduate cylinder, you go to one decimal place, go to 17.9, right? But because of the limitation on the sig figs of the concentrated stock solution, we don't have to be super accurate on our volume. But you might as well, right? If you're using a graduate cylinder, 50 mil cylinder, just go to 17.9. Why not? If you're using a burette, try to go to 17.91. 
and uh, get that out. And then we'll go see, see the video from lab on how to prepare the solution properly. How do you do that and get quantitative transfer for all of this? If you pour it out of a cylinder, a graduate cylinder, some of it's going to stick on the inside. How do you deal with that? That's what the lab video is for. There you go, my friends. Not too tough. We're done with this chapter. Yay. See you for the next one.